Okay, so guys, uh, we want to generally, if any of you have got a, a yacht site for one of your belated parents, you need to let me know in advance because when we do the learning, it elevates the uh, neshama uh, of any of your parents or anybody that you want to do a yacht site for because you're all putting an extreme amount of effort and it's much appreciated. So the first thing I wanted to just let you know is that when we actually started this year, funny enough, on the 21st of April, we started it on Yom HaShoah. HaShoah, I don't know if you're aware of that, which was a day dedicated to the 6 million Jews that died in the Holocaust. So I think it was a very auspicious time, and it wasn't on purpose that we started the shir. So the first shir, I forgot to dedicate to it because I didn't realize it was the date of Yom HaShoah. That's number one. Number two, today is dedicated to uh, Yom HaZikaron, the fallen soldiers of uh, Israel. Israel is a state today because people have sacrificed their lives in order to protect the state of Israel. And there were many victims of terror over the years in the hundreds and hundreds per, um, you know, uh, in the last few years alone. And the tens of thousands that have gave, given their lives as soldiers. So I want to dedicate the shir both to the Yom HaShoah, which I should have done 21st of April, as well as today for the uh, um, Yom HaZikaron for the fallen soldiers. So um, you must just let me know about the Yotzar thing. I wanted to just thank you very much as far as that's concerned. I'm just going to share another screen so we can get in the Gemara. Uh, everybody can hear me. Is that correct? Yeah, perfect. Okay. For some reason, uh, the volume here is very soft. I was wondering, Arthur, if you can just check my side for a second and see if it's me. Because uh, it might be my side. It's possible. this point. All right, how many minutes do we have left after, after this entire... I have no idea. Right. Okay. Did you not start right. the 40-minute timer on your side when you started? Uh, no, because I don't think we'd have technical issues for 10 minutes. Okay, okay. Well, now we know. No, no team view doing this because it lowers the volume. Okay. All right. All right, so let's get started. All right, can everybody, I can hear your background. Can, every, um, can everybody uh, look at the chart that Gavin did? Gavin did a bit of a fix up last night, and I just want to go through a couple of things first. Um, obviously, the Avos Mishnah was uh, ox, pit, mave, and fire. Now, what we did do is we discussed the scriptural references yesterday for goring. Um, sorry, we did goring uh, two days ago. And yesterday we discussed the scriptural reference for Shane and Regal. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're just going to look at the uh, oven told us for uh, Shane and Regal. Now, the main thing to remember about Shane is although the Av, Melocha, that it's talking about in the scriptural reference is referring to eating, the concept of Shane as a category, tooth, is about physical gratification. So there are two told us um, of Shane and one of, obviously Shane itself, the tooth is the of, because that's uh, mentioned historically uh, in Exodus. And the issue dealing with the two told us are conceptually the same. In other words, the animal does this for self gratification. One of the, uh, one of the, Examples it uses in the Gomorrah as a torda specifically is an animal rubbing up against the wall to satisfy an itch. So what happens is the equivalent to a, a car crashing through your wall in your house is that if there's a minibus taxi in Louis Boerter uh, and it comes into Sneddon and it cracks your wall, it has to pay for it. We're talking in the case where people are morally responsible and have insurance. Good luck in South Africa getting that money back. But in principle, that's what should happen. So rubbing up against the water satisfy an itch is physical gratification to the animal and the owner must make restitution. Soiling fruits. So what is described in the Gomorrah is rolling actually in a, uh, instead of in a vegetable patch, more in fruit uh, because vegetables are a little bit more hardy sometimes than, um, than fruit. So, for example, if you squish fruit, you're not going to sell it. Even if you sell it for jam, it's going to smell a bit horsey. 
So it's not exactly going to be a prized from a quality jam. But for vegetables, for sure, they're a bit hardy. I mean, if you think about it, you've got to be exceptionally strong to damage the turnip or parsnip because it's a bulbous root sort, uh, sort of vegetable. Now, soiling fruits, one of my definitions, which is not in the Gemara, which conceptually is the same, is for an example, an animal relieving itself. I had a bearded dragon, and a bearded dragon has this very stupid look of almost relief, because what happens is it uses its own water that it would drink in, because in nature there's a huge amount of water lying around, but in its cage, whenever it got that dumb look and it was in water, I knew it urinated itself and I had to change the water, which didn't smell too blacker. But if an animal relieves itself, uh, obviously in a person's uh, agricultural patch, then they're responsible, even if it's not the case in the Gomorrah, because that conceptually is uh, the same in terms of physical gratification. Now, what we want to say is as follows. We want to say that um, the um, that the told us of shame and the av is exactly the same because Ralph Papa was asking in the case uh, where the av and the told are different in terms of the halachic payments, and we can see that conceptually it's the same, and whether you transgress an av or a told av, the essence of it is that the animal is doing it for physical gratification. You own the animal, and the responsibility is on you to make restitution. So we see from this case that we're not talking about shame with regards to the other and the tordos being different. Now we come to the category of uh, foot, which is regal, and we discussed the scriptural source yesterday. If you remember, the shame and the regal both got its category uh, from the uh, same verse in Exodus that there was a hekesh. So the characteristic of regal is that it's the most common damage. Why? It's not that occasionally an animal doesn't gore or an animal doesn't eat for physical gratification, but every moment that the animal moves is, uh, in fact, a potential danger. And because that is the most common, uh, we refer to that as normal movement of the animal. And it contains, in regal, a case of trampling with the foot, but the tordos are as follows. It's caused, um, it's caused, there's just one thing, Gavin, that we need to fix up here. And this is my fault, it's not yours. I think your chart is amazing. Is the fact that the tordos is that the animal causes damage by its body by its body itself. In other words, foot regal has to do with the damage caused by the foot and trampling. The damage, the damage caused by its body in its normal walk is a torda. And if we have a look at the chart, it just says caused by animal movement. The torda is actually referring to an animal's body. Um, what's we, uh, Gav, you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I'll change it. Uh, no, 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 that's my fault. This is not your fault. You yeah. very kindly did the chart. So my apologies, guys. I should have been more specific. Um, in terms of the secondary case, and when we use the term secondary, we don't mean it's less of a total than the other. It's just another bullet point of mentioning. So let me say another tolda as opposed to the word, it's not a secondary tolda. It's as equal is that you only have oven told us. So another bullet point is that it's an animal's hair latching on something. I've used an example of a yak before because a yak has got particularly uh, molten, not, not, what do you call it, um, um, unusual hair in that a utensil can snag onto it and it can walk past and break something. Um, the other one is the animal's uh, backpack. That's a human donkeys were used specifically as well as oxen to load an animal. The fact that the same as we put uh, objects in a car's uh, boot uh, today. Um, so it was used carrying. So if you loaded it with goods and that animal walked past something and hit a chandelier uh, in the market, you would be uh, responsible for that. Um, an animal's bit in the mouth, obviously, if, if that knocked something over, what was it used for? An animal's bit in its mouth was used as a steering wheel. If you yanked the one side of the um, um, 
harness, it would turn left. If you yanked the other side, the animal would turn right. And the bell around its neck was used for generally a purpose of being able to alert people that the animal was coming. And uh, that in itself could have caused damage, that it could have knocked something, etc. So those are all told us of rigor. And what we see is a case where the Av uh, is exactly the same as Tordos. Again, if the Tordos occur, as well as the Av, you are liable for payment for both. There's no half damages, et cetera, et cetera. You're fully liable for payment. So in that case, the Tordos resembles the Av exactly the same, um, the Av being the scriptural source um, historically and the Tordos being conceptually the same. So according to Rav Papa, Rego, uh, we're not talking in the case of Rego, where we're trying to find an example of the subcategories being different to the, of the primary category. Because again, the main thing about Rego is its normal movement of the animal, and it's most common. The second aspect is that you're responsible for payment, and we see that the payment for Rego and the Tordos is the same. And the responsibility is on you as owner of the damager. So we've got no reason to see that the other and the tortoise are different. So that's what I wanted to mention to you. Just one thing is that um, Rego that was done in the public domain uh, is exempt because it uses the scriptural term done in the field of another. And we're going to get to what's covered in Shane. But Shane is a similar principle. But what used to happen then, as far as I know, is the cases that it w mentions where the body of the animal would damage a utensil, etc. I can only assume that the markets were owned privately uh, or the stores were private and there were common walkways for the animal. So if it was in the public domain where all animals walked, you were exempt. The minute you brought the animal into a place where a person had a store and it was technically their property, even though they sold to the public, if it knocked over your tent, so you were responsible for that. But I didn't live in that time, so I don't know exactly how it would play out. Does that make sense before we get on to the next part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, Marco? Yeah. Yeah, okay. makes sense. Good. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you one thing. We're going to discuss now uh, the scriptural source of the pit. I don't know if you can read that, guys. Yeah, yeah, you, can. Read you can read it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and, if, and, a, yeah. and if a man shall uncover a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it, and an ox or donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall return money to its owner, and the carcass shall be his. Exodus 21, colon 33 to 34. So a couple of things I want to know. I want, I want to just keep you in mind. The Gomorrah is not jumping from subject to subject. What you saw here is in the primary list of damages, the first thing that it dealt with was what? The ox. Okay? Yeah. The second issue that it's going to deal with is the pit. And then it's going to deal with the mave and the fire. What happens is sometimes it does take a detour and it goes back to the ox because sometimes a question comes up where the Gomorrah says, hang on a second, uh, this is what, what we wanted to deal with. Now, it should be seen on the surface that it should deal with it in absolute order. But you must realize that this is a very organic process and it's done in, this, in the order to elicit, as Arthur said yesterday to me in a conversation, the most amount of thought process and questions. And it's very, very clever. The more we do the Gomorrah, the more you'll see that that's the case. The reason I'm leaving this scriptural reference on the screen um, is that uh, you can see it as I'm referring to it. Now, one question I have for you, Art, when we're doing the recording of the video, I'd rather see the four of us than the, than the one scriptural source continually. Um, I've done that, Dan. That... You see on your left-hand side, it's four of you. We have to record. No, I don't, I don't see it. That's why I'm... That's no, what because, I'm no, because I've set yours in a different mode, but my recording mode is set up for... That's fine. Four, All right. Four people on the right and then the scripture source on, on the left. And I okay. made your... So I picked it as small as possible so it's, it's readable on all machines. Okay, good, good. Okay, so let's, let's get on with it. Um, 
so what we're going to do is the, now the Gemara seeks to identify the subcategories of, of pet because we're saying here, this, this the only thing is the Gemara turns around and says, uh, when, when Rav Papa said there are subcategories that are low, unlike their primary ca uh, categories, he said this with respect to the subcategory of pit. Now, the only difficulty I have when the Gemara says this in terms of line of questioning is it would imply that, that Rav Papa made a statement because it said he said this with respect to the subcategories of pit. But in essence, it's not the case. What he's saying is, is he saying this with respect to the subcategories of pit? Okay. So, so um, the Gemara seeks to identify the subcategories. So what it's saying is as follows. It's saying, if you will say that the subcategories of pit uh, are the same as the primary categories, let's examine. So what it's proposing is that a pit that tend to fuck him deep is capable of killing. And a pit that's nine to fachim deep or less is capable of injury. So therefore, the Gemara wants to propose that um, the Torda, the subcategory of pit, is nine to fachim or less, and that the Av is ten tefach. Okay? Yeah. Now, uh, if you want to know how much, uh, how much it is, you're looking to 35 to 40 inches uh, for a 10 tefach pit. How much is that? I know it's 2.2 centimeters in an inch. So you're looking at about a meter, approximately. Uh, is, is, that, is that correct, guys? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's about a meter. I saw here that, that, that link sometimes. Yeah. Okay, Gav, so you would know. I know. I know exactly, yeah. It's about a meter. Okay. So it say, so initially the Gemara wants to state that why do we say that a tent tefach pit is capable of killing? It says because for the mercy for one, whenever the Gemara refers to the mercy for one, it's obviously speaking to Hashem, about Hashem, sorry. And it says the carcass shall be his. If you look at the biblical reference, let's just examine the biblical reference. Um, at the end of the line, it says the owner of the pit shall make restitution, he real, shall return money to its owner, and the carcass shall be his. Now, when we use the term carcass, what do you think it implies? Do you think the animal came out of it in one piece? No. Exactly. Uh, absolutely not. Sir. Exactly. So, the minute there's a carcass, there's a death. Otherwise, you're dealing with a living animal. Okay. So, the problem that we're having here is uh, quite straightforward. And that problem is that the Gomorrah doesn't have necessarily uh, a basis for this. Why? Because, how, how do I put this? It's because there is a scriptural uh, source for the fact that a non tefach pit um, is also uh, a liability. In other words, what de what defines a uh, marker? What defines an up from a tolder? Um In this particular case, or in every know? case that we've discussed so far. Well, uh, what difference in damages? Uh, uh, if there, uh, um, well, in this, I don't know. In this particular case, you know, yes, the severity of the the issue. So, you know, ten tefach would be death, and less than that would be injury. So there would be a difference. Um, no, no, no. In a in a general case, you answer yeah, something, yeah. but in a general, in, in uh, what I'm looking for. Sorry, I should have been more clear. In a general yeah. case, what's the difference between an other and a toda? Because again, we have studied it. And we've seen their cases yeah. where Avin the Torda is no difference in terms of payment. Yes. But uh, what is the difference? Yeah. Even in a case where the payment is the same. Um, <laughs> severity? No, severity? No, um, well, the, severity would imply payment differences. In okay. other words, yeah. one is more severe than the well, next. Uh, you answer something. One's a rabbinical and one's a, 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 
uh, Tora source. I mean, that's one, one of them. Okay, you you almost there. Just word it a little uh, bit more accurately. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I was trying to work this one out. Um, um, intention, or, or no, um, no, no, I, I'm on it, sorry. Okay, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. There's often things you ask me, I'll say, I don't know, I'm getting back to you. So uh, yeah. what it would say very, very simply is that the Av has a scriptural basis in the five books of the Chumash, and the Torah yes. is conceptually the same, uh, and that's the difference. It's not necessarily a case of rabbinic or, or, or derisive in the sense that, again, if you commit a, a Torah, um, for example, on purpose, in breaking Shabbos, one gets the death penalty. So we, we're mm -hmm. not talking about a less severe case. What we're talking about is the fact that one has a, script, a scriptural reference, being the Av, and the Torah does not. And there are cases, as we said, where the severity is the same and severity is not. So far, mm. in Baba Kama, we can't find a case where the Torah is less severe than the Av. Even in Karen, because Karen yeah. is the Av. And there you pay half okay. damages because of the habitual nature of the animal versus a tame animal. And not because it's a Torah. So we see the one is just a scriptural reference. So far, we haven't seen any payment damages. So with regards to a pit, the Gomorrah wanted to initially propose that what would make it an Av is the fact that the uh, it's ten tefach because the uh, scriptural sources and the carcass shall be his implying that the owner has to make rep uh, restitution when the uh, victim's animal uh, dies in the pit, that the pit has caused death. Mm. And it's saying it's a problem because why should the uh, pit that's nine tefach or less be considered a torda. It wanted to propose that originally. Mm. And the reason why it's a problem is if you read that full, full Exodus source of 21 colon 33 to 34, it deals with damages as well as death. And I'll prove it to you. Or the Gomorrah will mm. prove it to you. I, I just read the Gomorrah. I'm nothing um, mm. um, insightful here. So it says, and if a man shall uncover a pit or man shall dig a pit and not cover it, an ox or a donkey falls into it. It says this year will end in two, uh, 10 minutes. Guys, we need to start another year after this because half of it was technical issues. We really haven't covered much ground. Uh, and then Arthur will join it. Um, is that okay with both of you guys? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. I'm cool, sir. Thanks, Arthur. And listen, Arthur, you've been doing your best. These technical gremlins are not your fault. Arthur is a technical genius. Without him, I couldn't find my way out of the paper bag. Okay, so let's go back into it. An ox or donkey falls into it. The owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall return money to its owner, and the carcass shall be his. So let me just rephrase it. So we're talking about a case where an ox and donkey falls into it. The owner shall make restitution. The second part where it's talking about, it's repeating the phrase. He shall return money to its owner, and the carcass shall be his. So it's talking about in the one case making restitution, and the other case returning money. It's a superfluous statement, returning money. Because if you're making restitution, why do you have to say you're returning money? Because the returning of money uh, to its owner, and the carcass shall be his, is talking about death. And uh, yeah. an ox or donkey falls in, and making restitution is about damage. What's the proof? It could have said an ox or donkey falls in and dies. The very fact that it didn't mention the word and does and talks about restitution is talking about damage. Therefore, the fact that an animal is damaged cannot be presented here as a torda because there's a scriptural source for the damage being an av and death being an av. So it's not as the Gemara wanted to initially propose that perhaps the damage is a torda and the av is the uh, death of an animal. Rather, that both the uh, damage as well as the death, based on scriptural source, because an av means a scriptural source, is covered. So the uh, non tefach or less pit um, is, is an av, and so is a ten tefach pit, which can cause death. So both uh, death and damage is an av. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Any questions? Okay. So, um, 
Also, I want to bring one thing to your attention. If a man shall uncover a pit or a man shall dig a pit and not cover it. So you liable both of you the first time and you decide to dig a pit and you never covered it or you uncover a pit that somebody else did. And why does it say that? Because you could say, listen, it's not my problem. Uh, yeah, I took the manhole, but the pit was there. It's not my problem. So it's saying whenever you create a public hazard, whether you did it in entirety or you did it partially, you are responsible. And the Gemara is going to go through a case where who's responsible? Say there was a non tefach pit and now you dug an extra tefach. Is the last person responsible for the death of the animal or is the, are they both jointly responsible? So this is going to be discussed in a later Gemara, um, which is going to be a very, very interesting case. Um, we've got six minutes and 49 seconds left. We're going to just do the best we can. I see the little clock ticking below. Um, let me just go through the scriptural sources. If any of you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer it. Now, one, que one thing that is important here is that the Gemara wants to propose something else here. What it wants to uh, propose is that the Torah that Rav Papa is referring to, or the Gemara is referring to, is a person's stone knife or burden, or burden which he placed in the public domain and that caused damage. Let me just explain to you. A person's stone knife or burden. Now, you might say today, what's the importance of a stone? I mean, the stone's worthless. We're talking about a stone like a stonemason. You know where people used to sharpen swords and all sorts of other things, and a stone was used to crush, etc. Well, you had very, very specific sort of articles that would, us, for us today, seem worthless, that then were part of your tools of your trade. Um, you know, sometimes you could get a stone axe, I don't know if you're aware of it, where people in pilgrims that first came to the U.S. would use stone to create in the woods, um, cabins, etc., etc., because steel wasn't always available. There were times when it wasn't. A person's knife is used as a tool uh, to cut and develop and tan hides and, and scrape, etc., and a burden. So what does it mean by burden? A burden today is generally people's wife. Um, but then it meant something different. It meant a burden, meaning you're carrying a heavy, heavy load. And when you're carrying a heavy, heavy load, you can't carry it anymore. So you just dump it in the public domain. And when you dump it in the public domain, it's going to cause injury. So in a case where it's going to cause injury, uh, those are known as the tor dust. In other words, a stone, a knife, or a burden that's placed in the public domain can cause damage. Um, it, seems, it, it can cause damage from inception. In other words, the minute you leave it there, if somebody's vehicle goes over it, uh, it can damage. If somebody's horse goes over it, it can fracture the leg of a horse or penetrate through the hoof. So that's what you have to bear in mind. Now, just one quick uh, issue is that according to Rav and Shmuel, this is defined as the subcategory of pit where the item is considered ownerless. So what's this thing of ownerless? Is that if, if you still hold on to the object that if somebody said, hey, you lost something important, uh, do you want it back? And you say, yes, it's not ownerless because you haven't given up on the object. So there's a whole discussion in the Gemara in 28B, which is brought up here, that uh, basically Shmuel regards damage um, to an object if it's left in the public domain, meaning whether or not you consider it ownerless or not, because a pit is ownerless. Nobody says that's my pit. You're digging a hole, it's got no value, and it happens to be an obstruction in the, um, in the public domain. So Shmuel says whether you consider the object valuable or not, or you haven't given up control of the object, if you leave it in the public domain, it's regarded as a tort of pit and you're responsible. Rav maintains, that if you if it's not ownerless, that it actually resembles ox. And and therefore you're still responsible because we said that tortoise of ox are the same like ox. So this is not a case where Rav Papa is talking about. However, one thing that you've got to bear in mind is that when we say it resembles ox, it can't really. It's actually an amalgamation of ox and pit. You have a term where you're taking the common characteristic of both and uh, what Rav is actually saying is that it resembles oxen that it's your property, but it's, it still has a commonality of pit, of pit in that if it's in the public place, 
it's liable to cause damage. So it's almost an amalgamation of two features. Uh, so whether, whether, whether you consider it ox or you consider it pit, the damage is exactly the same. The other method is of equal uh, uh, damage. Because we remember that uh, uh, the, the other problem is that Regal is not responsible in a public domain. So that's the one objection to it. And the other objection to it is that um, it's, 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 not, it's not quite a case because it's not carrying where the half damage is. So if you want to say it's a tort, it's a bit confusing. So uh, that, that, that it's, so in other words, um, even, even according to Rav, it's still considered uh, resembling pit. Because let's study the Tordas and the Av. In other words, the initial creation of the pit, or all of these other articles of the Torda, a person, stone, a knife, or burden, is there to create damage from inception. You have to pay for it, whether it's an Av or Torda, and the, and the damage is caused by you, and you have to take responsibility. So this is not a case that Rav Papa is talking about, because the the other metoda of pit are exactly, exactly the same. And even in a case where it's uh, ownerless or not, both Shmuel and Rav agree uh, that the uh, the Torda and the Av are the same, even though they don't agree in terms of ownerless and somebody that creates uh, ownership with the particular object. So obviously, Rav Papa cannot be talking in a case of pit. Is there any questions? We've got one minute left. No, I'm cool. No, I'm good. Michael? Good. Michael? Good. Fine. Got it. Got, Got it. it. Okay. So Arthur sent us a good uh, article in Vavakama, is that what is a tefach in a modern measurement? So it, it uh, examines it and it describes it as four fingers. So if you take your thumb out, and you rest your hand on the table, four fingers worth is considered a tefach. Now, a tefach is a difference of size according to certain opinions of eight centimeters, and in other opinions, 10.67 centimeters. Obviously, because people have different size hands. So um, it basically says that one tefach um, is four fingers. And three tefachim is measured as, as one zerith, whatever zerith is. So the article is on Baba Kama. And Arthur, I want to thank you so, so much for that because it adds a lot of clarity. And you can understand when it says 10 uh, uh, tefach is a killing pit, if you take it at eight centimeters, uh, eight, 80 centimeters is not even high. So when they say lower than that of non tefach is not capable of killing, generally a small pit that's 40 or 50 centimeters can cause injury, but not uh, death. So it's very practical. Oh, thank you. Now, one thing, guys, I do want to bring into the fall is that it doesn't mean that if the animal dies and it's non tefach that you don't pay any damages. Because if you pay for injury, of an animal that's less than their non tefach, it doesn't stand to reason that if it's 10 tefach or more, that you pay nothing if the animal dies. What you would simply pay from what logic would deduce, and I need to find this out, is you would pay the equivalent of the maximum damage that you would pay for an animal within that category, but not as much as death. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 Nice. Okay, good. Good. All right, so let, let me, let's just go on a sec. And, and deal with the, the next sort of issues. So we've seen now that the subcategories of pit and the main categories of pit are exactly the same because it's prone from uh, it's prone to damage from its very inception. Um, it's, it's your responsibility as the digger or the person that have, hasn't failed to cover the pit properly of somebody else's pit. And uh, the obligation of watching it is on you. So just to summarize, the subcategories of pit are the same as the uh, major categories of pit in that, um, according to Rav Papa, we're not talking about a case of pit because the subcategories in the avos, the tortoise and the avos are identical. 
even though the description of what they are is different, the payment stringency is the same. So we now want to analyze, the Gemara wants to analyze what case could Rav Papa be talking about. So now, what's the next thing on the list? We've, again, we've covered ox. Again, we've now covered pit. And what's the third one, guys? Fire. No, no. ox before fire. Uh, mave. Yes, mave. Gavin. Yes. I understand how Arthur thought Have and Mave Ram, so I can understand how you made one the other. So Shor and Bor. By the way, it's an easy way to remember it. Shor, uh, Shor Habor Mave Have. It's such an easy way to remember the full Mishnayot. Um, so we're talking about a category of Mave. Now, uh, it's we don't know what Mave is at this stage. Remember in the beginning, it was a Aramaic word or, or Hebrew word. And, and it didn't expose on, on, on what the definition was. So there's an argument in the Gemara according to the interpretation of Shmuel and according to the interpretation of Rav. So according to Shmuel, the interpretation of Mave means shame. Okay? And we're going to see now how this could be. Because why? We've discussed the categories of shame. So now how can all of a sudden... Uh, Mave be referring to shame. And we're going to discuss this now. So just remember in principle, Shmuel refers to Mave as shame. And if it does refer to it as shame, according to Shmuel, Rav Papa cannot be talking about a case where the subcategory of Mave is different to the primary category. Why? Because we established that the subcategories of shame, the Tordos of shame, are exactly the same as the Av of shame in terms of concept and stringency. So uh, according to Shmuel, Rav Papa could not be talking about Mave. Now, we've got another opinion. The mission according to Rav refers to Mave as man, mankind. And for this, we're trying to determine if the other taught us are the same in, or difference in terms of payment stringency. So what is it talking about here? So, it's to, the Gemara wants to propose the first thing of it. Let's say the Av refers to a man when he's in the state of awakeness. You know, his normal day-to-day -day activities. And it wants to propose that the Torda is when man is asleep. And they want to say that surely uh, the, the, the uh, Torda and the Av are different in that particular case. Because how do we know that when a person's asleep, that they're responsible. Now, Arthur and Michael, uh, sorry, Michael and Gavin have touched on this, but for Arthur, this is new for you. And what, what, what it brings in the Gemara is as follows. It actually brings it in a Mushna, and it says, a man is always moored, whether awake or asleep. He's always moored, whether awake or asleep. Now, when we say muad, what we mean is that even though it's a torda, we would might think that, okay, so he's responsible, but maybe he shouldn't pay the full degree of payments. And maybe he should pay partial payments. Or maybe he shouldn't pay it all because he's asleep. But what we're saying here, according to Mishnah, is that he is fully responsible for payment, whether he's asleep or awake. Now, is this something off that you would have thought, yes or no? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, look. I, I, I thought the sleeping thing would be kind of strange. I suppose you can sleepwalk and do stuff as well, so you can't get out of that that way. Yeah. Okay. So it's 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 not it's not intuitive. You're completely correct, and that's why the Gemara brings it in a Mishnah, because if it was intuitive, you'd have no reason to bring it forward. Why? I'm staying at you for Shabbos. I said to you, listen, buddy. I knocked your lamp in the sleep. And you'd say, you know, it was an expensive lab. You need to replace. And I'd say, listen, I'm sleeping. It's not my fault. So that's exactly why the Mishnah brings it. But if you look at it deeper, you'll find that it makes sense that you're responsible. Because when a person is awake, before they go to sleep, it is their obligation, not the owners necessarily, to put away articles that are delicate. Because you have to assume that in your sleep, you've got no control. And if you've got no control when you sleep, when you're awake and you work on that sort of premise, you're responsible. And the proof of it is as follows, is when you've got an ox, you can't read the mind of an animal. 
you can't say the ox, dam uh, the ox damaged and uh, I've got no control. I'm not a mind reader. You've got to assume the ox is going to damage. Just like you've got to assume when you're sleeping, you're not in control either. And therefore, you have to pack away any articles around your bed when you're staying at somebody for Shabbos. Because if you break them, you have to pay for them. And if you want to turn around and say that the owner should have put those articles away, away, it's not his responsibility when he's getting ready for Shabbos and making sure you're a welcome guest in his home to run after you. It's not his responsibility. If you damage something in his house, you're an adult. You should have put it away uh, properly. So you are responsible for food damages, not even pot. So yeah, this is okay. a case yeah. where we, can, we, we could say two arguments. That if the Torda, let's, let's say a Torda is a sleeping man and the other is an awake man. This can't be the case that Rav Papa is referring to. Because again, you're fully responsible for full damages and stringency, you moored, whether it's the Torda or the Av. And Rav Papa wants to bring a case where the Torda and the Av are different, meaning that the Torda are less payments than the Av, the primary category. And obviously in the case according to uh, Shmuel, where it's referring to Shane, we said the Torda and the Av, are the same payments, so we can't be referring to Shmuel's definition of my, uh, um, Shane, according uh, of what Shane means, Mave, according to Rav Papa, nor Rav's view, where Shane is referring to, uh, where Mave is referring to man, because we just saw that if the Torda is sleeping and you're fully responsible for full payment, so too with the Av, you're fully responsible for payment while awake. So therefore, this is not a case where Rav Papa is referring to. Before I go on, are there any questions? Uh, yes, interview? James. James, I, I got something for you. I was thinking, with the sleeping and the wake, it would be, I'd say the sleeping could also refer to as darkness, because normally it will be a night time where you can't see things, you knock things over. So no, sure it doesn't mean, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't I'm just saying, I just, my thought was that. It doesn't mention the, uh, that at all, but let's just say, that conceptually a Torda, let's go along with your reasoning, because it's I think it's a good question. But even though the, the Mishnah doesn't mention it, if we say that Tordas, like just like soiling uh, where an animal relieves itself from fruits would make you liable, even though it's not mentioned in the Gemara, because again it's for physical gratification, etc., and you and and you damage somebody's property. Let's just say when somebody's knocked something over and it's dark. Let's just take your case off. He would be responsible because what should happen is he needs to check prior to the lights going out. Does the owner have a, a timer in terms of a light? And while the light is on, because generally the lights go off at 10 or 12 p.m. when you're in somebody's home, you ask the owner what time do the lights go off? And you make sure while you can see, you have to arrive at a person's house before Shabbos. Or even if you arrive at it when it's dark, they're still with electricity. They've got a timing switch that goes off. And if it's in the bedroom, if you go into somebody for Shabbos, you pick up the phone and say, I'd love to come to you for Shabbos. But if my bedroom light is already off, can you make sure that if there's no uh, light there, that you just put away things that I can't knock over in the dark? So you have to take the precaution. So it's a, I think it's a great question. Just because it's not mentioned as a told her, doesn't mean it's not a valid fact. Does that make sense? No, it, it wasn't that. I'm saying... Uh... What is it if it's not the dark? It's not, there's no scriptural source for it. Both is a Torda uh, in the Gomorrah. Uh, neither is a... Ah, but what I'm saying is if you want to include your example as a Torda, meaning you damage when you can't see, you still more it. Because I know, that's what I'm game. trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. The darkness... Because uh, I mean, think about it. people. I mean, it's just how I'm thinking. I mean, it's just something I thought of. I mean, if somebody yeah. at night yeah. knocks over something, they're responsible whether they were sleeping or not for that thing because nighttime is not when you sleep. So, it was no, just no, no. Of, but what I'm saying is as follows I want to just clear something up mm -hmm. here is that people generally, uh, if you look at all these cases, how the Mishnah ends, the Mishnah is it turns around and says, that you are responsible if you damage something and it's up to you to make restitution. So whether it's because it's dark or a person's sleeping and they have no control of their body, you're responsible. So okay, let's move on. Does that make sense? Huh? 
and that you have to ask the owner before Shabbos about the uh, uh, time switch. And if there is no time switch, you've got to ask him just to put things away if you're arriving at house, his house after Shul and there's already no light in your room. Okay. So, so it's a great point. I think it's good. It makes sense to me. I just brought and up a discussion I, times. Pardon? I just brought up the, like, have a bit of discussion because it is good to see different points and whether it's so. right or wrong. It's like proper yeshiva. I, I think so. And it's not wrong. Your point is absolutely valid. It's still your responsibility though. That's what I'm saying. And I think it does make sense. So we're clearly not talking about uh, this uh, case where we're talking about a waking or sleep man, according to Rav Pat. Papa. So the Gemara wants to maybe propose another option that Rav Papa is talking about. There is an opinion that says a person's, a person's saliva or mucus is a torda of man. Why? The actual torda is a man while he's awake and a person's saliva or mucus is um, sorry, an av is while a person's awake and a person's saliva or mucus is a torda because it's coming from their particular force and it damages while it's moving. Okay, so let's just discuss this quickly, is that it's referred to as your force for a very, very simple reason. If I pick up a stone and I throw it through your window, I'm responsible for paying for that. I can't say the stone randomly went through your window. I have to say that it was propelled by my force. So it's a tolder of my force that I picked up the stone, even say, for example, I'm playing cricket and a jack of six and it's my bat, but it's my force that hit the bat that hit the ball. And it's referred to in the same way, I suppose, as saliva or mucus, that it was my uh, force or part of my body while in a trajectory of movement uh, that caused the damage. So for, say, for example, uh, in the old days, I don't know if you've seen that they used to, they still do it in America, like in Texas or whatever. They've got this disgusting habit of chewing tobacco. The nicotine is released, but often you'll see these movies where they chew tobacco and they spit it out on the floor. Uh, disgusting. I think even smoking at least looks better, even though the person gets cancer. But, um, and by the way, for chewing tobacco, you do get throat cancer. You might not get lung cancer. Uh, so with regards to this, if you spit on somebody's clothing, say you're eating mulberries and the mulberries have a dye in it, and while you're talking, you spit, and that spit lands on somebody else's silk white dress. You have to pay for that. So we can see in this case, even though the saliva or mucus is a torda of the of, you would still have to pay full, full damages. So in this way, we can't be referring to uh, the torda being different to the of, of being man and torda, his force, his saliva or mucus, because the damages are astringent when a case of the saliva or mucus is proposed as the damage. Just one thing, that when you tobacco spit and it lands on the ground, it is no longer a case of mave and the torda of mave. It's a case of pit. Michael, do you want to suggest why it's a case of pit, alakhigli? Or Gavin, because you we've touched on this before. Arthur wouldn't know yet. What's the question? Sorry, I didn't hear correctly. Okay, what I'm saying is there's two different sort of damage that can be caused by a spit. The one is the trajectory while in motion. So what we're saying is if a man throws a stone through a window, his trajectory, it's his force that has caused the damage to the window. Same as if he plays cricket and he hits the ball through. And that's considered a torda of, of man, a torda of mave. According to Rav, where mave is mankind, uh, here we're saying that that force by man, in the case of saliva or mucus or, or jacking a cricket ball, the Gemara mentioned specifically the torda being the mucus, but we can say conceptually the torda could also be um, throwing something through a window or hitting something through a window even if it's through indirectly through a cricket bat, that you are responsible. But what I'm saying is when we take a case, for example, of somebody that chews tobacco, they don't generally spit it at other people. That's why I used an example of a mulberries, that you're eating mulberries for dessert. And you're talking to somebody and a bit of your spit light lands on one of the other guests' white dress and they can't get it out of the dry cleaner. You have to pay for it. 
So we're talking a case of Texas where they, uh, they chew tobacco and they spit it on the ground. Now, in that case, it's not the force damaging directly. What, ha what, what do you think it would be a case of then? What would be a case of, sorry? Can't, I didn't hear that last part. Gavin, uh, Michael, can you hear me? Can the rest of you guys... No, no, me? just the last part, it just went blank. I couldn't hear what you said. No, I understand, but I'm trying to check, Gav, if the rest of the people have that problem uh, with the volume. Because if you all can't hear me, it's a problem. Uh, no, I, I can hear you. I, I just think uh, the last part of the question... Well. I get the last part of the question. I, I've got the, all the stuff leading to it, but what is the actual question? Yeah, I okay. think we didn't actual question hear the last part. The it went blank. No problem. When you, when you said went blank, I wasn't sure if the volume or the fact of my clarity. Now that we've determined it's my lack of clarity, I'm going to repose the question. Fine. When an object, when your spit is in motion and your saliva or mucus damages the property of another, another's garment, etc. That is considered mm. a quarter of man. And according to Rav, man is the actual of, and the torda of man, man's force, um, is actually the torda. So in that case, that's a torda of mave. It's a subcategory of man, according to Rav. And what I'm saying is, if you're chewing tobacco and you spit it on the ground, and it doesn't land directly on a person. What is that a torda of? Is it a torda of man or is it a torda of pit? Pit. Excellent. Why? Because it, uh, because it's, it, its effect is uh, neutral. Uh, it's well, it's falling into an unknown space. It's falling into something that uh, doesn't have. A implication for damages on, on anybody unless obviously it's 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 similar to a pit because a pit can or cannot cause damage yeah uh, you know depending on the i'm confused just say it in a simple um, way for that a silly person like me can way. well it's definitely pit because it, because it's because it's uh, uh, it, it's different to the case where a man uh, spit uh, okay, I want to know damage. why it's but you, you're right, but I want to simple somebody for somebody simple like me. Explain yeah. to me in one sentence why it's put. It's a sentence. Because it's falling on the ground. It's falling on the ground. Exactly. So, so that's somebody what I can, want to know. In let other me words, add something. Let me add something, yes. Damon. Yes. Um, if somebody spits on the ground, then somebody can sip on that. Simple that's as that. it. So, uh, Gavin, that's exactly it. That's what the word I was looking for. In other words, let's look at a pit. You can fall into it. So, from its inception, it's prone to damage. It's in a public place, like pit. When you spit on the ground, um, when you spit on the ground and somebody slips on it, it's just like a pit where somebody falls in the it. It's prone to damage from inception, and it's not in the privacy of your own garden. It's where people walk. It's in a public place. And based on that, that's considered pit. So, Michael, you're completely right it's pit, but for the reason that Gavin said, in that it's prone to damage from inception because people would become damaged if they walk on it, just like they'd fall in a pit, that slip on the mucus or saliva. So, both of you guys, that was excellent. And by the way, it's not that Arthur never had the insight because he's not bright, he's super bright. He just hasn't done uh, this particular duff before. So I'm sure Arthur would have come up with it anyway, same as you two guys. So brilliant. But isn't the pit, isn't it similar to the pit also the reason that it's, it's non-living? That's, 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 imma that's immaterial here to okay. a certain extent because uh, the, the category of Mave is that it is living. So it's coming from, the mucus is coming from a living person. Uh, okay. Okay. So it, in other words, it's uh, it's put for the reasons we mentioned. But let's just say, even if we take it your way, whether it's living or whether it's not living, it's damaging. And it either damages from the trajectory, which is labeled a tort of man, uh, mm. which is Mave according to Rav, or alternatively, uh, it's landed and somebody can slip in it at which it is a tort of pit. 
And in that case, it's stationary, but it was caused from a living person. Okay. So, so either way, you're prone to damage. Now, by the way... Can I ask not... a question quickly? Yeah. Okay, it's quite an interesting question. If somebody's at a, a, a Shabbos table and he sneezes and he makes somebody sick and they get flu, is he liable for damages? Um, firstly, I don't know. I'm going to propose a thought here, but I honestly don't know. If it's a case, for example, of the coronavirus, where people are warned, and in that case, when they're warned, they know that they actually could provide somebody with a lethal disease, then absolutely they are responsible because they shouldn't be in public. But a sneeze is uncontrollable and spontaneous. In fact, we don't realize that when we sneeze, our eyes close. That's how involuntary it is. So in that case, I don't think so. However, if it can be proven that the person had the cold uh, and was known to be sick prior to coming to the table, yeah. then they are responsible because they were forewarned. Uh, so that's an excellent question. I want to make one point though. It's not that Rav says that the Torda are necessarily a person's spit. Rav just says that Mave is a case where it's mankind. And the Gomorrah poses, according to the Mishma, Mishna, two probabilities. That uh, a Torda is man when he's sleeping and he's Moat, he's totally responsible whether he's awake or asleep. So there it proves that the other and the Torda are uh, to both in terms of full payment stringency. You can't argue that when a person's asleep, it's half damages because they were unaware or no damages at all. And then the case of pit, sorry, the case of a person's spit or saliva, which is also proposed by the Gomorrah as a torda of man, is uh, the same because you pay for damages in full. But Rav is not saying that torda is the spit or the mucus, nor that when man's sleeping. The Gomorrah states this. He's just saying that Mave refers to uh, man, and where Shmuel refers to uh, Mave as shame. And we're going to see that both Shmuel and Rav have a solid argument there. And even though we covered shame, we said that shame, the Tordas and the Av of shame are that you pay full payment whether it's a Torda and an Av, because you're responsible for the damage of the animal's physical gratification. On a separate note, even according to, uh, to, to Rav's opinion that it's man, if the mucus lands and it resembles a pit and that is prone to damage from inception in a public place, somebody slips in it, you're still responsible for damage in full, whether or not it's a Torda or not. So in all these cases, this is not what Rav Papa is uh, talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, fine. So what we've done is we've, uh, we're have we going to uh, go again tomorrow. Uh, I just wanted to thank you all of you for attending very much. And uh, I hope the Aliyah of those that were lost in uh, Yom Ashua, where we started this year on the 21st, of April, as well as today, Yom Azdikaron for the fallen soldiers, as well as the victims of terror in Israel, that this should elevate their aliyah, as well as all of our family that have already passed on, and may nobody else pass on that we love, and anybody else from the Jewish people. I hope everybody is well, and I hope Mashiach comes soon. And I want to thank all you guys for attending, and all your Amen. questions are valid. Thanks, Amen to everything you said there as well. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thank Have a wonderful, wonderful Thank day. You. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your time, Damon. And thanks Pleasure. for your input and your and your uh, preparation. Very good. Appreciate it. Pleasure, guys. Lovely thanks, to mate. see you. Thanks, mate. Honestly, please for don't forget day. to send... Damon, please don't forget to send me the um, uh, the toll dots for the... For, for the, the other ones. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can do grass. And listen, off your question was also great. Just because the Torda is not mentioned uh, doesn't mean it's not a valid Torda. The Tordas that are mentioned and Tordas that are not. So it's nice to have everybody participate and I miss you all and I love seeing you every day. Have a good day further. All right, you too. Thanks, Damon. Pleasure, guys. Ciao. Thanks, guys. Cheers, guys. Ciao.